Well, as always, it is extremely good to be here today, uh, to be with you and worship together and share in the word together this morning. Uh, today is the first Sunday after Easter, and all the preparation today with, with the songs, prayers, is leading up towards this idea of the mutability of God. The immutability of God is that God never changes, although life does change. And if we go to the first Sunday after Easter, what was happening? If we go back to Easter Sunday, as we call it, the Resurrection Sunday, I like to use, things were changing dramatically for the followers of Jesus. He was their Messiah. He was the Savior. They were his disciples. He promised them all these things, but they didn't understand it fully. Just like we can never understand fully what God is doing now in our lives. And that's kind of what I want to speak into today. How God is involved in our lives. He's always, and I mean always, giving us opportunities to serve him, to grow in him, to serve other people. Resurrection day, Christ was buried. People didn't know what was happening. There were changes happening. And it would take us just a moment or two to the road to Emmaus, the two disciples that were going along the road to Emmaus, and they were just talking with you, and Jesus comes up disguised to them and begins to speak to them, and they talk about what was going on, and they say to him these words, are you the only one in Jerusalem or in Judea that doesn't know what's happening? There's changes happening. Jesus was crucified. He was buried. Now we don't know where he's at. After the changes that happened, it was followed by a certain amount of chaos. And that chaos is what life is about so often. Probably a lot more than we like it to be. We don't like the chaos in life. But that's where God is working. You've heard me speak about crucibles in life. And I want to follow up a little bit with that this morning. What did these disciples do after Jesus finally revealed himself to them when they had supper that night? He broke the bread. They ran back to Jerusalem and met with the disciples that evening. And as they did, they told about seeing the Lord. So they had their hearts turned back to the Lord. That's what God does when we have chaos coming into our life following changes. And God said to, or said through Jesus, said through the, the disciples in that upper room, have faith. Jesus walked through the walls that night. He ate with them, showed him the holes in his ankles, in his wrist where the nails were. Life was again put back in some sort of order. There's never a complete order to life because there's always changes going on. Every change draws us back to God. This is still the pattern today in life. And just to catch you up, I don't think I've been here for few months, five, six months maybe, or more. Uh, what's kind of happening with me? After retiring as a pastor, I thought, you know, am I going to lose my identity? And so, you know, went to the Lord, and, and my goal was serve him, serve people. Kind of let it go with that. God has been doing a lot in my life in offering opportunities to do ministry. I'm doing a lot of counseling, 10, 15 times a week. I just finished a certification for ACBC. 
which is the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors in what is called a specialization in addiction counseling. Been doing more addiction counseling than I've ever done before, and I've always done some. I got this certification. There were some online classes. There was exams to do, uh, 1,400 pages of reading and books, an interview. Uh, and as soon as I got that done, I went to do a certification with the Addiction Connection, another group uh, that I'm associated with. And just Friday afternoon, finished my certification for them. Uh, Friday night, they sent me an email and said, would you be a commissioner for Addiction Connection to help train other people? And I said, well, might as well. I'm training about 10, 15 people now to do addictions counseling. We have classes in Greenville. Um, God has taken many of the people I've been counseling and letting me do discipleship with them. And now am training them to do ministry, especially addictions ministry. One of the projects that I've been working on is writing a book of, from the book of James, writing a paper, a booklet, or something. Um, and the Addiction Connection has asked me to present a, this paper uh, in November at their conference. Uh, and within this paper, the biggest reason I can't get it done, I keep adding stuff to it. The more I study, the more I see, i got to put this in. And now I'm up to chapter 5, and it was just a paper. Uh, and chapter 5 is about the immutability of God and how God never changes. And so that kind of brings my life, what I'm doing, uh, up to what we're doing here. I know there's been a lot of changes that you're going through. And as I go around to a lot of churches and speak and teach and work with pastors and helping several pastors to start addiction meetings in their churches. There's five or six churches I'm doing that with. So within all of that, uh, I see an increase in people wanting to do ministry, to get involved in helping other people because there's such a need and it's just rising to the top. We have the government, we have the media telling us, you're stressed out so bad you can't handle it. And everybody says, yeah, that's what we are. But God says, no, there may be some stress in your life, there may be some changes, but you can handle it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, we were in such a we were wanting to die. We had so much stress in our life. But God allowed this so that we would turn to him. That's what God wants us to do, to turn to him. And as we turn to him, he will always give us everything we need to do the ministry he calls us to do. And that's what he has for you right now, today. He has ministry for you to do, opportunities. And this is just something that I see all the time. And coming back to the book of James, where we look at trials that we go through, crucibles, so that we can become more like Christ uh, one of those verses in there is verse 4 in James 1 where it says perseverance must finish its work. We go through trials so we can become mature so that there can be perseverance in our life. And that perseverance that comes in, to our hearts feels like it's more than we could ever handle. But God is always giving us more than we can handle so he can work in our life. And he says this perseverance of going through the trial must finish its work. We have to hang in there. We have to let God work in our lives, in our trials. And then he can do great things. In verses... Um, 
16, 17, and 18, it says, But God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. He is the one who does not change like shifting shadows. God never changes. And that got me back to the immutability of God. And I remember I looked up some things I did eight or ten years ago on the attributes of God, some sermons and some teachings. And immutability was one of those ones that stuck with me a lot. And God will work with us. And so we have to ask the question that comes up so often is who is God? Everybody has an answer for that. But it's something that needs to change. When we talk about things changing for us, we need to change in our definition of who is God. The more God works in our life, the more we understand who he is. And we look today, this idea that God does not change. Satan knew that, but yet he put those doubts in Eve when he said to her during that first session of temptations, did God really say? You know, that's what people are doing today. Did God really say that's the way family life ought to be. That's the way marriage ought to be. That's the way church ought to be. That's the way life ought to be. Doubt is what Satan uses. And we know, as we start in here this morning uh, with this, that God never changes. Society has always been wanting and trying to change God and his commandments. And we have to resist that and say, no, that cannot happen. Society says, and it's some part of the main tenets of psychology, is that we need a new family order. The old family order that was given in the Bible is so outdated. And this has been going on for a hundred years in our country, that they are trying to reorder what the family looks like. They're trying to create a new worship order for God himself. Society is saying maybe we can create God in our image. Make him like God. Make us or make God like us. Go through Isaiah 44 and study the idols of the heart. Isaiah Talking and God is saying, these people go out and they, they cut down wood from the forest, a tree. And that wood that I grew, and God said, I grew that tree. I watered it. I gave it sunshine. It's mine. And people cut it down. And part of that tree, they make furniture. Part of that tree, they build a fire to keep warm. They build a fire to cook their food, their bread. And then with what's left of that, they build an idol that looks like themselves. That's what idols, they look like us. We're creating idols all the time. Now, we don't go always make them out of wood, but we can have idols of all kinds. My idol is, this is how my job ought to be. This is the kind of car I should have. This is the kind of house and surroundings and landscape I have to have. These are the toys I have to have. It says these ways of life that I look at in my family, the way my children behave, the way my spouse behaves and treats me becomes an idol in life. We make all these idols to what we think and in Isaiah 44, it says, all these idols are made. People bow down. They worship those idols. And what they say to those idols is what's really important here. They pray to the idols, save me. Take care of me. An idol can't do that. God goes on to say, idols can't speak. They can't hear. It's a piece of wood. 
Idols do nothing to bring us closer to God or to give us that satisfaction that lasts forever in life. Only God can do that. Knowing that God cannot change gives us a stability of hopefulness that we can have in this world that is ever-changing. The word immutability is really a lot more than just not changing. We kind of have that definition. But as you go to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is a catechism for children, it, question four, what is God? And the answer is, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. He's unchangeable in all of those things. So we have to spread out our thinking and understanding to the point that it's more than just not changing. It's not changing in his wisdom, in his power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. He can't change his character. In Malachi 3.6, we'll start with this verse this morning just as a way to launch into this. It says, it's basically, I the Lord do not change. So that is so encompassing within that verse. I the Lord do not change. We can build everything on that. And what I want to take us to as we kind of go through the sermon, where we'll come out in the sermon in point three later on, is how does prayer work? When life is changing, that brings us, drives us, forces us to prayer more than anything. We pray about the changes in life all the time. That's what we do. That's how God designed us. If God is never changing, we have to ask, how can prayer change anything? And that's kind of one of those questions that we grow with in life all the time as we mature. Have you ever asked God to intervene or to change what's going on in your life? And we all have. We do that. And one of the things that happens in counseling so often, people will say, when I ask them about the, what they're going through and the struggles, and they say, I prayed about it. You know, and my thought is, what are you praying about? And I ask him that. How are you praying? What are you praying for? What's going on within this? And quite often, very high majority, people will say back to me, I'm praying for God to give me what I want. They may not use those words, but they're saying, Lord, I've got this figured out. I know what I need, and I want you to give it to me. Bowing down to those idols and saying, save me. This is what I want. The prayer should be, and we should all be here, is, Lord, I'm going through these changes. I don't like them. Do in me what you want to do. Help me to change. According to the answer we get from God, if we're really listening to him, our responsibility is to rearrange our lives. Adam and Eve had their lives rearranged. When they ate from the tree, God came. You know, they thought they were in control. They made the fig leaves. They hid from God. They thought, we'll take care of what's going on in our life. God said, no, take those fig leaves off. And he sacrificed a couple animals, made the coverings from the skin, covered their sins. God was in control. God has not changed. He still covers us, but it's through the blood of Christ. He didn't change when Christ brought the new covenant. It was fulfilled in him. Number one, 
God cannot change. And we looked at these verses. He doesn't, he's a God that doesn't change like shifting shadows. God is stable. Stability is what we look for in life all the time. Stability is our desire. And the reason that it is that God put that within us to desire stability, knowing that he's the only one that will ever give us stability. He doesn't change like shadows. And shadows, if you, especially with shadows outside with the sun, uh, not talk about artificial, but shadows out in the sun, never sit still. And if, if we sit very long and watch a shadow, it just continually moving. There's a new day coming. There's new morning mercies all the time. Another verse that speaks into God not changing is 1 Samuel 15, 29. He who is the glory of Israel, like that's God, the glory of Israel, that's a title, does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. You know, we change our mind all the time. That's what God wants us to do. We're built to change our minds, to grow, to learn, to be educated, to grow spiritually. We need to change. God does not because you know, God has a plan that started before the earth was formed. God never has to think through his plan. He never says, okay, Lord, they're doing this. They're doing that. I've got to figure out what to do next. God never does that. He knows everything, and he cannot change. We know that full well. Okay. Something brand new happened here. And, okay, I pushed that button three times and it didn't work. Do it another time. I'm without notes. <laughs> oh, that wouldn't help. <laughs> Open it back up again. That always helps. God never changes, right? But I do. Computers change. <laughs> so we readjust. Back on track. God is faithful. Deuteronomy 7, 9. The idea when Moses is bringing the people out of Egypt. You know, they saw changes that were unbelievable changes in their life. In Deuteronomy 7, 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. You like it? The Lord your God is God. You know, there's no other. He is the faithful God, keeping his commandments of love to a thousand generations to those who love him. And keep his commands. Deuteronomy 32, a little later on in the book. He is the rock. His works are perfect. All his ways are just. Faithful God. All those titles of God. He is faithful. He is God. He keeps commandments. He does no wrong. He is upright. He is just in all he does. And we need to understand that in everything we do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. God is faithful. 1 John 1, 9, as we think more about confession of sin, receiving forgiveness, it says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful. 
that part right in the middle of that. God is faithful. He cannot change. He will purify us, forgive us of all of our sins. We don't even have to ask for forgive. He just forgives us because he is faithful. He says, I will forgive you. He has to forgive us. That's the immutability of God. And this is where we find the most hope in all of life. The next one, there is no potentiality in God. You know, this is one that kind of helps us meditate, it helps us to think about God a little deeper, to think about our own lives. There's no potentiality in God. How much potentiality do we have? A lot. You know, every one of us are looking for the potentiality that God has in our life to serve him, to serve others, to grow in our knowledge and grow in our faithfulness to God. You know, in uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, for all things were created by him and for him and all things are held together in him. All of this is for him. He holds the universe together until it's time for him to change. We look at the universe, it's changing constantly. The earth, which is under a curse because of the sin of Adam and Eve, is changing constantly. Some of it is good, some of it's not. A lot of it is predictable. You know, we knew what time the sun was coming up this morning. If we look at the charts, and it's been the same, you know, and it, we know in six years when the sun's coming up on a certain date. That part doesn't change. We even have to adjust the days and months sometimes on our calendar to stay with what God is doing, which never changes. But then there's the changes that come with storms, things that are unpredictable, things that show God is in control. God does not change and he cannot change. Another one, God is absolutely simple or indivisible. And we have to understand what simple means. Simple means he is one. He cannot be divided. There is one, and it does not change. God is one, and nothing can be added to God. We can't add anything. He doesn't need anything added to him at all. He is complete. We cannot add to or take away from who God is. Back to Isaiah 44. The carpenter measures with a line. He uses a compass and he uses a pencil and he outlines to make this idol that he is making. He shapes it and he forms it like a man. And now we can see this a little clearer that he makes this idol to look like himself. He says, my idol is beautiful. It looks like me. That's creating God in our own image. That's when we read earlier, or talked about earlier. He says, save me, you are my God, with a little g. That we have to be very careful that we're not creating idols that look like us, that look like what we want them to look like and say, save me. God says in Exodus, you will have no other gods before me. It's in the Ten Commandments. This is how important this is to God. It's number one. Have no other, I am God. I am the Lord your God. Have no one before me. No other gods. In Revelation 22, 18, last book of the Bible, where there's no sin. In Revelation 20 and 22, 
Genesis 1 and 2. There's no sin in those two bookends of the Bible. Everything else in the middle is dealing with sin. But he says in Revelation, if anyone adds anything to them, meaning the prophecies of this book, God will add to him the plagues that are described in this book. God is serious about this. He's serious about us staying focused on him who never changes. The next bullet, God is absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect, as I chose that, uh, just to put some emphasis on it, because how many things do we say are perfect in life? Order a meal in a restaurant, and I've heard over and over again from waitresses, that's perfect. And I'm like, how do you know what's perfect for me to eat? <laughs> but it's, it's a word that people use, and without thinking about what it really means, and especially what it means in comparison to God. The immutability of God means he is perfect. And if God is perfect, nothing else can be perfect. If God is an awesome God, nothing else can be awesome in life. In Deuteronomy, we go back to this verse in 32.4 again. He is the rock. His works are perfect. He is faithful. God is perfect. We are to magnify the Lord and everything that he does. We don't make him bigger. We magnify him in our life, in our thoughts, because we're not there yet to be able to magnify him for all he is worth. Number two, why some people think God can change. This is a very hot topic today. People aren't going around saying, I want to change God, but that's what they're doing. They don't say, I want to change Scripture, but that's what they're doing. They're changing what God said to be life. We see changes in his creation. The world is constantly changing. Big topic today. But within that, we never see his essence changing. We even take verses uh, like Genesis 6, 6. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth and his heart was filled with pain. In that bullet, we see the blank there. God was sorry that he had made man. He didn't say it was a mistake. He never said, I wished I wouldn't have done that. He said it grieved him. I did it knowing it was going to grieve me. You know, when we have children, we may not talk about it all the time, but we know they're going to grieve us. How do we know that? We grieved our parents. It happens. Time and time again, there is grief that happens because of relationships. But the word grieved means to, to be sorry, uh, to have compassion. And that's the one definition I think that applies here. God was sorry that he had man and he was, I am compassionate to the man that I have made. He's always providing a way out when there is sin. He provides the idea of confession. He provides his forgiveness. God didn't say in Genesis 6:6, 6, 6, I changed my mind about creating mankind. He's not good anymore. You know, he created mankind, says he, this is all good. It's still good because man will still. Give him glory for all eternity. The next bullet. Because he is unlike a changing world. Is what we have to see. And sometimes people say that God 
can change. But we have to say, he is unlike a changing world. 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we who are with unveiled faces all reflect God's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. We're always increasing in glory. Number three, does God change his mind when we pray? Now we come back to where we're going to come out of this sermon. Does God change his mind when we pray? Uh, There's books written on this, so I'm probably not going to answer every thought on this this morning. But we want to get the idea that God cannot change. If we read something in Scripture that says God does not change, and then we come over here and say, yeah, but God changed about this, something's not right. And so we have to say what we understand about how God changes, how God answers prayers, never can affect his immutability. When we pray and God answers differently than what we pray, which I think is the answer to most prayers. We don't too often get what we pray for. Even the Bible says to seek and pray and keep praying. Uh, Repeat your prayers. We still may not get what we want. If we would just get what we want, we might as well be God. We pray. God answers differently. We can be disappointed in the answer. We can be hurt. We need to adjust our lives to God's answer. God is always giving us new opportunities. So we pray. God gives us something different. He gives us opportunities to minister. We have to adjust our life to that answer, which brings us to the next bullet. Prayer is the means to change us. Prayer is a means to change me, to change you. That's what prayer is about. It's not getting what we want. In Luke 5, 8, Simon Peter saw Jesus. He fell down before him and says, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. That's where we have to start. I am sinful. George MacDonald, uh, over 100 years ago in England, was uh, answered a response to a newspaper that said, what is the worst problem in the world? You know, how would you answer that today? What's the worst problem in the world? And we got a, quite a list of things we could name of what's the worst problem in the world. And he wrote back and said, I am the worst problem in the world. And if we can start there, we can answer some questions in life. We can make a difference in other people's lives. We need to understand that sin matters in life. Grace and forgiveness can only be understood and appreciated as we understand our own wickedness and sinfulness. We are the ones in need of change. We get tired of changing. It's hard work. We don't like it. It makes us weary. But the Bible says do not become weary in doing good. Change me. We are not in total control. We're not in hardly any control. That hurts. We don't like it. We fight against it. Prayer, the next bullet, is meant to get His will, get God's will done here on earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth. That's what we pray for. Prayer is not to get our will done in heaven. And when we begin to really think about how perfect heaven is and how God is in total control there, how many of us could improve what's going on in heaven? 
How many of us could say, let's tweak this a little bit? We can't do that on earth either. We still turn to God. How can I be a part of his kingdom here on earth? Prayer is not to get our will done. Prayer happens in our heart. The answers to prayer happens in our heart to help us glorify God. And we come to our closing thought this morning, a question. What changes can you make to improve your inner reality of worship? Your inner reality. This is like, let's get serious. What's the worship in my heart towards God? How much of the worship in my heart is towards me and what I want? What changes do I need to make in the inner reality of my heart? What do I need to change? Are we earnestly asking God, help me change to be more like Christ? Help me change to do your ministry. God is always faithful to his promises. And his promises is he will take care of us. His love and care for us can never change. He loves us beyond more than what we know. He lavishes his love on us. This is our hope in life as we are living with him. Continually seek him to change your life towards God and other people. Lord, we thank you today that you are so faithful, that your promises are real, that they can never change, that you can never change, Lord, and that you are always giving us opportunities to serve, to glorify you. And I pray for everyone here, Lord, to take your words and to use them in their lives to change the worship in their hearts and to see opportunities that maybe have never been seen before to be a church that is serving and glorifying you. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.